All right, and it's seven, so let's get started. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, so tonight we're going to talk about the virtue of patience. So we're going to talk about kashanti, as it's called, uh, patient tolerance, as it also is sometimes translated, except we're not going to start with that. I want to uh, do, do something else to begin. So if you've been following along, you know, we've been reading this Upaya Sutra. And last week, I was supposed to do two sections of this. We were going to talk about the Buddha's backache and the Buddha's headache, but I only got around to dealing with the fact that he had a backache and therefore asked Kashyapa to teach on his behalf. And so we wound up going over that section. So I didn't get to the section about the Buddha's headache. And it's not so much that I want to talk about the Buddha's headache, but there's an idea in this section that I want to I want to talk about. I think it's an interesting idea. And it's also, it'll be a very interesting way to segue to the other part of the sutra um so yeah so if you have this book and you want to read along um i'm on page 463 um as a reminder just in case we're going over a section of the sutra that's talking about these series of unfortunate events that happened in the life of the buddha some like bad things that happened to the buddha and we've been reading this section, which has sort of been giving us a sort of um, a Mahayana retelling of these stories. And so the question is, the first question for tonight is, why did the Buddha say, my head is aching when the Sakya clan was defeated? So even before I get into this, let me tell you, I've been researching the background on this story. As you know, the Buddha is from a clan of people from India called the Sakyas. And of course, the Buddha is sometimes called Sakya or Shakya Muni, the Muni or the sage of the Shakya people. And the backstory on this, like the original backstory of this, it was sort of about that there was a big war and it was a war between a certain group, a certain uh, warrior who went to war with the Sakya people and defeated the Sakya tribe or the Sakya clan. And there's this sort of moment when the Sakya clan was defeated, kind of like uh, Ben Kenobi in Star Wars, the Buddha sort of gets a headache. He, it's like something, there's a, been a disturbance in the force because of this defeating of the Sakyas. So the Buddha sort of feels this defeat in the form of a headache. And there is a backstory to like, what is the past karma that brought this headache about? But I just want you to know that's that's what it's sort of referring to. But it's really, we're not really interested so much in the headache and the backstory. But it's this. So some people thought, or some people said, when the, the Sakyas were defeated, some people said, the world honored one cannot benefit his own clan. He does not take pity on them or wish to give them security. Since he left the household life, he's had no feelings for his clan and no desire to save or protect them. This is what somebody thought. These sentient beings said so because they did not know the facts. The Tathagata, the Buddha, had transcended all suffering. However, knowing those sentient beings' thoughts, he sat under a withered tree 
and said that, it has, that his head was aching. Now, when I said to Ananda, this is the Buddha talking, he said, when I said to Ananda that my head was aching, there were 3,000 gods present in the assembly who held the view of nihilism, as well as numberless sentient beings who were inclined to kill. In order to manifest the existence of karmic hindrances to those gods who held the view of nihilism and those beings who delighted in killing, the Buddha said, the Buddha said, because I once enjoyed seeing a person kill, now I suffer from a headache. After I said this, the Buddha says, 7,000 humans and gods were brought to peace or subdued or tamed. And this was all the Tathagata's upaya. This was all the Tathagata's ingenuity. So what I want to focus on to start us off tonight is this idea of all of these gods who held the view of nihilism. And I want to kind of talk about this. I've done Dharma talks about this in the past, so this isn't going to be a lengthy Dharma talk about it. But I do want to kind of set up a few ideas before we move on to the actual kind of topic for tonight. They're, they're very related. So this reference to nihilism. Nihilism, of course, is a kind of, mm, well, first of all, it's an English word. Second of all, it's kind of a technical philosophical term for a certain philosophical position. But there's a relationship between modern, like fairly modern, nihilism and what they're referring to. So what they're referring to is an idea or a topic that gets talked about a lot in early Buddhism. And what it is, is it's what you may know of as the two extreme views. And the two extreme views are normally translated or normally called eternalism and annihilationism. This sutra, this translator is, is calling annihilationism nihilism. There's a some finer differences between the philosophical position of annihilationism, as it could be called, and nihilism, but the differences are slight. The position is more or less the same, though. So interestingly, and if you don't, if you haven't heard this or you don't know this, this is actually, I, I find this very interesting. It's about sort of, well, what, what makes Buddhism Buddhism? Like as a tradition, especially as a philosophical tradition, like what's up with Buddhism? And what the Buddha will say, and he says this in many of the early sutras, the Buddha says, oh, well, what I'm teaching avoids the two extreme views. Whereas, and this is, I'm summarizing, of course, whereas all other religious and philosophical traditions are either a form of eternalism or a form of annihilationism. But Buddhism avoids those two extremes. So if you have never thought about this, and even if you have thought about this, I would encourage you to think about it more. But if you've never thought about this, then let me kind of walk you through it. It's actually very simple, but very interesting. So the idea is, is that we're thinking about, well, you know, we're thinking about the world. We're thinking about everything in the world. We're thinking about you. We're thinking about me. We're thinking about sentient beings and all of that. And what we're interested in is, is there something, anything, 
that lasts forever? Is there something eternal? Because obviously, like my teacup is not eternal, right? A, a good, a good, you know, fall, and it's it's done in that way. So my teacup's not going to last forever. M material things, as far as I can tell, are not going to last forever. This body is not going to last forever. So what? What if if I were one of these eternalists that the Buddha is talking about? What would I think lasts forever? God, <laughs> meaning Brahma, uh, the Atman, the soul or the essence was considered eternal. That might be about it. There's sort of more to those ideas, but I think God and the soul will suffice. Like we don't go have to go much deeper than that. So the idea is, is that one position is that there is something that is eternal. And it's either the divine or again, God or Brahma, the creator. You take your, you know, you call it what you want to call it in that sense. But there's an understanding that God, just to use this conventional English word, lasts forever, is eternal. Now, as you may know, that within traditional Indian religion slash philosophy, in traditional Indian thinking, in addition to Brahma, in addition to God being eternal, there is traditionally understood to be an aspect of you, an aspect of me, in fact, an aspect of all sentient beings, that is called the Atman. And the Atman was considered and is considered, because there are people who are still in this, in this worldview, the Atman, that little bit of soul essence that is in, inside you somewhere, well, it's that Atman that reincarnates. And then reincarnates again and reincarnates again. And actually, the idea is, is that it could potentially keep doing that forever and ever and ever. The Atman could keep reincarnating eternally because, excuse me, the Atman is considered to be an aspect of Brahma. It is called the divine aspect in that sense. And so the soul or the essence, the Atman, being an aspect of Brahma is eternal. Now, what that means is, is that your Atman is either going to be eternally trapped in the cycle of death, birth, and rebirth, or in traditional Indian thinking, you can escape samsara and the atman can effectively merge back with brahma and then you are now in eternal bliss in brahma as brahma i've never been there so i don't know what verb to use but the idea is is that the eternal aspect returns to the eternal meanwhile all of this earthly material stuff, yeah, all of that is impermanent, but an eternalist, and by the way, there is no one in, in India, there is no one who is like, I am an eternalist. <laughs> there are different philosophies that believe in something eternal. And as a category, they are called eternalists. And in many ways, anything like Christianity, a, nor, a, a Western religion is a form of eternalism because they believe in the eternal nature of God in that sense. So that's eternalism. Over on the other side, we've got this nihilism or annihilationism. 
annihilationism or nihilism is the philosophical position that everything is falling apart everything is effectively impermanent in that sense and so everything eventually go comes to nihility everything comes to nothingness annihilation everything and that's the position of an annihilationist and by the way it's the position of a nihilist the buddha says what i'm teaching the dharma that i'm teaching avoids those two extreme views now the idea here is it, now the first thing that i want to do before we go any further is <laughs> I don't know if you've ever thought about it, like about, is there something that's eternal? Is it just all impermanent in that way? But the idea here is, is that whether you've thought about this or not, think, think about it now and ask yourself, well, what do you think? <laughs> do you think there's something eternal or are you uh, oh, and by the way, the position that we're describing as nihilism, annihilationism, it also could be called just scientific materialism. And it's the idea that everything is under a kind of constant state of flux and change, state changes, and nothing stays the same in that sense. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to say that nihilism is like its own special philosophical category because nihilism, nihilism sort of basically denies any morality because why would there be, everything's gonna fall apart anyways. So why would it be wrong to bring something to nihility, by which I mean kill? A nihilist is like, wait, everything's going that direction anyways. So why would it be wrong to, bring it to its final conclusion that it's destined to anyways. So nihilism is actually in dialogue with ethics and morality, whereas annihilationism is more of a scientific position about everything falling apart in that way. And then different people can come to different moral or ethical conclusions based upon that understanding. So once again, the idea is, is what kind of uh, uh, view do you have? Yeah, Mar Maria, please. Hmm. <clears throat> oh. oh, yeah, let me, I'm, I'm, let's see, can I? Oh, where are you? There you are. There we go. Ah, there you go. Um, so, um, question, uh, is, is it um, the Buddhist position that conditioned reality is infinite and eternal in that way or um am i getting that wrong <laughs> <clears throat> well um that sounded a little wrong but i don't want to uh, judge it too quickly in that way kind of repeat like kind of come at this a different angle so yeah so um is it the buddhist position that that conditioned reality is um infinite sort of mm. um and and in that way um um eternal no. um and okay okay so and i i haven't gotten to the buddhist view yet right we're getting there. right okay but that was kind of where um i was sitting um mm. so so yeah that's that's interesting yep I'll, and i'll stay tuned on on uh, uh on that note you know maria i want to remind you too that even though we're about to get deeper into this mahayana sutra everything i'm talking about right now is sort of early buddhism basic buddhism 
So I let I want to make that clear that I'm really operating from a, a very basic point of view. And, and all forms of Buddhism, by the way, make this statement that Buddhism avoids the two extreme views. So it, I don't know if this will answer your question at all, Maria, but what we're saying then is that Buddhism is neither eternalist, nothing is eternal, but it's also not annihilationism either. It avoids the two extreme views. And before I kind of give you like the, the answer in that way, I wanted us to sort of sit for a moment with those two options. And in many ways, I would want you to, you know, many of you may already know the answer of like how it is that Buddhism avoids these two extreme views. But if you don't know the answer, what could? What could be neither eternalist or annihilationist? It boggles the mind. <laughs> It, 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 it's like, well, no, I, I can only imagine it being one way or the other. Oh, and I want to remind you too, even if you're kind of like into the idea of reincarnation, but you maybe you think that eventually the life force energy peters out somehow. So like it, you might go on for thousands and thousands and thousands of years but eventually you will come to nihility or come to annihilation, that's still a form of annihilationism. So it doesn't matter how long this takes. This is about what, do you think things are going to go on forever? Or do you think things are impermanent in that, in that way? Now, to make this simpler or more simple, I guess, I want to start focusing exclusively on the what we would call the self all right and what i mean is is that yeah we could be talking about a lot of different things lasting forever or not lasting forever but i want to get right to the like the important thing is that they're talking about you and there's a question about do you think there's an aspect of you that goes on forever or do you think this is it? That as soon as this falls apart, done. Again, which are you? Where, you know, which camp do you fall into, right? So here's the thing about it. And this is always a tricky thing to like try to make simple, but I'm going to try. So here's how it is that I understand how it is that Buddhism avoids the two extreme views. It has to do with the question of existence. It has to actually do with this idea of something existing. You know, the way that like I exist right now. Hi, I'm existing, right? And the idea here is, is that in terms of this existent, thing. There's a conundrum. Does it exist forever? Or does it exist for a temporary amount of time? And we begin to notice that our thinking about eternity or temporary, temporary, temporality, <laughs> temporariness, Eternity and temporariness, those two ideas that we are currently kind of struggling with, like, or philosophically we are wondering about, as a, the first thing of Buddhism that we want to recognize is that both of those are predicated on the idea, both of those are predicated on the idea of something to exist to begin with that it already exists, and now we're wondering about its fate. Does it go on forever? Do I? And again, it doesn't have to be this body, but it's this me, this I. Does it go on forever? 
or does it eventually die and go out of existence? Both of those ideas are already, both of them already agree and believe in the existence of the self. And then because there is the belief in the existence of the self, we can wonder, do I, leave, do I live forever or am I temporary? And of course, what the Buddha realized is that our thinking about existence is all wrong. What is the self? What is the self that exists? And the Buddha realized, oh, there is no self that exists, like as an existent, meaning an existent thing. And this is the teaching of no self. And as soon as you realize or understand no self, you realize that there isn't something to go on forever or to die. And that understanding of in the early tradition, no self, in the Mahayana tradition, the emptiness of all dharmas, but that idea, call it no self or call it emptiness, it sort of, it pulls the rug out from underneath of existence so that there is no longer understood to be an existent thing there. And what the Buddha then kind of realized or what Buddhism realizes is that, oh, then all of this thinking about going to heaven and living forever, or all of this dreadful thinking about going out of existence and dying, both of those are erroneous. <clears throat> and this is, again, I, I mention this often, in the early Hinayana, like the early teachings, Buddhism is often referred to as the teachings of the deathless, not teachings of immortality, not teachings about living forever, but teachings about deathlessness, by which we are referring to this awakening, this insight that the thing that I am worried about going out of existence or the thing that I think might live forever that thing just doesn't exist the way that I think. And that is how it avoids the two extreme views. Questions about that? Yeah, Maria. Oh. There it is. Okay. Um, so maybe a better way to ask my prior question would be, is would the Buddha say that samsaric realm, the samsaric realm is infinite? <clears throat> mm, no, and I could answer that in many different ways as far as like kind of cosmologically. Is this so one of the questions that the Buddha refused to answer? Nope. Okay. It sounds like it should be, though. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And so the idea about in terms of samsara, of course, is cosmologically, you know, the whole world, the whole universe <clears throat> in Buddhism comes to nothingness and then kind of reformulates in a new way. So it's not, per that's not permanent. But again, there was understood to be a kind of an, an escape hatch. Originally, there was understood to be an escape hatch where you could get to Brahma. You could get to the eternal and live forever. But samsara was always going to fall apart. But again, Buddhism is not a tradition of going to heaven to live with God forever. But it's also not scientific materialism. And I know some of you might have been confused or thrown a little bit off when I introduced annihilationism as everything is impermanent. And uh, you might have been like, but wait, isn't that the teaching of the Buddha that everything is impermanent? 
yes, it is the teaching of the Buddha that everything is impermanent because everything is impermanent. But that doesn't mean that there's a self that's impermanent. The self, from what you know, we talk about every almost every Sunday night, the self is a fiction. The self is a fabrication of this current state of consciousness that's listening to this. The, whatever is listening to this is a current state of consciousness that might be thinking in terms of self. But that's a fabrication in that way. And so I want to make it clear, I did not annihilate you, meaning I didn't just annihilate consciousness. Like, no, you are here. Hi. But it's a question of what you think that is that is conscious of this right now so okay so the connection or one connection that i want to make is you'll notice that the buddha says that there were these three thousand gods in the assembly who held the view of nihilism and there were also numberless sentient beings who were inclined to kill. So they're making a connection there. The sutra is making a connection between a kind of violence, the killing in that way, and this kind of nihilism and kind of putting those together in this kind of package, uh, a problematic package in that way. And as I was mentioning, uh, a few minutes ago when I was talking about nihilism, like official, formal, modern, or philosophical nihilism. And I was mentioning that nihilism is like, you know, a, kind of about morality and ethics and how in a way there are, are no moral or, or ethics because of everything coming to nihility. So all of a sudden, I want you to notice that if you had that mentality of nihility or annihilationism, there's a way in which killing is not as problematic if everything is going that direction anyway. So this is sort of the position of these gods and all of these people in that way. And, you know, really quickly, just to, I want to make a note of this. I, it's something that I kind of often like to point out. So, of course, the first, like the first precept, avoiding harm, avoiding killing, this is like, you know, number one in that way. And so Buddhism, of course, is founded on no killing. And yes, there's sort of like a tiered, like, what I, I, a hierarchy to that, which I mean that Buddhism does put homicide, the killing of other humans as gr grave, grave sin, but does recognize that violence in any form, murder, killing in any way is sort of an unwholesome dharma in that sense. And one of the things that I kind of like to point out, and it has to do with, um, what is it? Well, this, the language of being inclined to kill. And what I often like to point out is, you know, I would, I would hope nobody in the audience here listening has any, you know, violent tendencies in that way in terms of, you know, murder or something like that. But what I like to point out is it's about sort of the, the mind and I, I use often like the idea of like a mosquito and a mosquito coming and landing on you. And there's this kind of one mindset or one state of mind that is like, die. And like wants the mosquito to be dead. And like, you know, wants it dead. There's another mentality that doesn't want to be bitten by the mosquito, but also doesn't want to be violent, that doesn't want to kill. And so takes steps to avoid killing in that way. And what the very kind of simple idea that I kind of would like to instill or to impart is that from a certain Buddhist point of view, in terms of the mind, in terms of samskara, in terms of habits, 
there's a way in which what it is doesn't matter. It's the mentality that wants another life to no longer be alive. And at that point, it doesn't matter in a way how big or how small these creatures are in that way. It's the mentality that is like, die, versus a kind of, I mean, catch and, it's a catch and release world for many Buddhists, like myself included. And what I mean by catch and release is that bugs in my house, they get escorted outside. You know, we, it's like, we kind of try to maintain like no violence, or I try to maintain in my mind, no violence, no killing, regardless of what it is. And then Eve, and I get all of this from my time being around Buddhists, like in monasteries and seeing the, the, the degrees to which real Buddhists go to avoid harm and injury. And so taking a, a cue from them, I recognize that I don't want to have it in my mind. And so even if it's a situation where I have to do it for one reason or another, and it has happened that there have been kind of invasive creatures coming in the house that I had to get rid of, if if it comes to that, I try to do it with the utmost compassion, the utmost kindness, the utmost love in that way, even in a way chanting my own money, Padme homes and all of that. Um, and what I kind of want to emphasize is you may be thinking like, you know, that's maybe going a little far, you know, chanting and all of that for you know, some ants, right? But the point is, is this is about cultivating a mentality. And we can cultivate a mentality that becomes inured to violence. We can cultivate a mentality that almost delights in violence. We can cultivate that. We can feed our minds with all kinds of violence to the point where it's normal, even in a way cool or what have you. So you can do that to your mind. And I personally am trying to condition my mind the other way to kind of always be in a state of compassion and kindness in that sense. And that's for me, like I've just sort of realized the, the detriment to my own self of that, have having a violent mind. And I've realized sort of the, uh, you know, I hate the language of purity, but a kind of, it doesn't feel as gunky in there in that way. And I like that not feeling gunky. And so I keep trying to cultivate that. So, <laughs> all right. Everybody doing okay with all of that on that first note? Okay. And, ah, actually interesting. I had forgotten that that was the, so, I mentioned that these stories about these unfortunate events of the Buddha, I mentioned that they are old stories that have one version. And then this sutra is giving us like a new uh, revamped Mahayana version. So the old version is the Buddha got a headache because once in a past life, he enjoyed seeing a person kill. So that wasn't even about a past life of the Buddha of him being violent, but actually enjoying seeing somebody else be violent. And so for that, he got this headache. This is saying that that's not actually what happened because the Buddha would never enjoy anybody, <laughs> you know, be. This is kind of trying to protect the Buddha in that way and saying the Buddha would never enjoy violence. He only said that because there were these gods watching that entertained the view of nihilism. And so in order to teach them in that way, he got a headache and complained of being, having a headache. So. Okay, so that's our quick little excursion into the two extreme views and how Buddhism avoids them. 
now, this is the one that I really wanted to read tonight and the kind of the more topic I really wanted to talk about. So also on page 463, if you're reading along, the question is, why did the Buddha remain patient when the Brahmin, Baharadavaja, a keen mind, reviled him with five hundred kinds of abusive words. Well, by way of his miraculous power, the Tathagata could have thrown this Brahmin to another world. He also could have made this Brahmin unable to utter a single abusive word. But at that time, there were many gods and humans in the assembly. They saw that the, that the Tathagata could put up with this bitter abuse without saying anything in retort. And, at, and that, the Tathagata felt just as he had. Let me back up. So the gods that were in the assembly, they saw that the Tathagata could put up with this bitter abuse without saying anything in retort, and that the Tathagata felt just as he had felt before he was reviled, <laughs> with a mind of equanimity, beneficence, and patience. Okay. Uh, I'll finish reading that, but let's talk about patience. So I wanted to talk, I wanted to kind of dwell on this tonight because I just think it's so so important to the practice it's for me it's so important to buddhism and what it is is it's this practice of kashanti right so k s a n t i kashanti which is translated as patience patient tolerance um, I often point out that the root, the root of the word kashanti is shanti, which means peace. You may have heard the chant om shanti shanti, om shanti om. So shanti is peace, kashanti is peacefulness, passivity in that way. So the story, the story is pretty straightforward. There was this Brahmin and who was just hurling insults at the Buddha, 500 different kinds of insults, right? And the Buddha just showed no response in that way to these abusive words, and therefore demonstrated this kashanti. So, you know, you may know that kashanti is the third paramita, the third practice or the third aspect of the bodhisattva path after giving and moral discipline, right? So, and there's a lot of um, stories, kind of like this story of the Brahmin. There's a lot of stories about the Buddha, about the monks, the nuns, different people within the world of Buddhism of doing, of demonstrating this patience and I think it's such a, like, personally, I feel like it's an aspect of Buddhism that just isn't spoken about enough. There's a way in which, you know, meditation is almost synonymous with Buddhism. But frankly, in my world, Kashanti is synonymous with Buddhism. And again, let's kind of go a little deeper into the idea of Kashanti. So, you know, Kashanti is very much about anger. And what I mean is it's about not <laughs> getting angry. So it's the kind of the opposite of, of getting angered. But there's other emotions that are involved in this. It's about not, not being bitter, not being resentful, again, not being angry, uh, not being, you know, just... Uh, peeved or you know there's these words of being like annoyed all of those versus what this idea of kashanti and 
to start, or kind of as a way to ease us into a, this conversation about Kashanti, I want you to think about it this way. I heard I heard somebody put it, or I heard somebody say this. They weren't talking about Kashanti. They were talking about something else. But I heard somebody say this, and I thought, that's really smart. Like, that's a really insightful upaya. And what it is, is imagine... Imagine that I was sitting here hurling insults at you in a language that you don't speak. And let's say I had a smile on my face while I was doing it, right? You would just sit there and you would probably not respond because you wouldn't know what to respond to. You wouldn't be offended. You wouldn't be angered, right? Likewise, actually, by the way, let's actually, let's put it in this context because I just thought of this. If I was speaking in a language that you don't speak and I was just throwing praise upon you, but I was like, mean mugging you while I did it, right? I was kind of like, but I was like, you're such a beautiful person. You're so smart. But I was doing it kind of like, you know, in a way that you wouldn't know that. Even though I was praising you, you wouldn't know what to do with it because <laughs> you wouldn't know what I'm saying, right? So the really, really, the insight here is to recognize that if some sounds come out of my mouth that you do understand, and it's like, you're ugly. If you get offended by that, we need to understand that I have not made you angry. You made yourself angry. Because a minute ago, I was hurling insults at you but you didn't know what to do with them. You, you weren't translating them into insults and therefore being insulted. And so you were rather equanimous about it all. You weren't getting excited because I was praising you, but you also weren't getting angry if I was insulting you. It was equanimous. But all of a sudden I say it, I say some sounds that you interpret as words with meaning that's about you. And then you get angry or upset about it. Once again, who made you angry again? I know that we like to point the finger at, say, the person who said the insults. But if you really think about this, you have to recognize that we make ourselves angry. Nobody does it to us. That's a very subtle point about Kashanti, which is this idea that nobody's doing it to us. We're causing this in that way. Now, regarding the insult, what I want to do is unpack that a little bit further too. Because I want you to recognize that a sound could come out of my mouth and the sound could be, you're ugly. But then I want you to notice a translation process that turns those sounds into words. But then what I also want you to notice is that you would be upset about that or you potentially could be upset about that because I said something about you. And so now we would want it from a Buddhist point of view, we would want to notice attachment to self-identity and then attachment to self-identity that thinks I'm not stupid. <laughs> And then this person says this thing about the self. 
And it is in contrast to what I think about the self, which is that I'm not stupid. So now we're starting to see the arising of the anger and the arising of the anger is deep. And what I mean by that is, is that why are we angry if someone says something? Uh, great question, Renata, and I'm going to get around to that idea. But it is actually, Renata asked this question about, is, is anger always about the self? And what I would encourage you to think about is, is it? Meaning, look deeper at anger. And is there a way of being angry without a self? Oh, and at that point, too, I would want to then interject no self for everybody. It's not just you that doesn't have a self. This is true of all sentient beings in that way, that the idea of the self. So again, now going back to Renata's question about is anger always about the self or selves? I don't, you know, I'm not going to cycle through every possible moment of anger and, and wonder if it's about the self, but the self is a deep part of anger. And I have spent a decent amount of time thinking about this. And it does seem to me that anger can be traced back to that clinging notion to a self. Because what we would want to do is sort of flip it, as I often like to say, and ask oneself, well, if I was sort of not attached to the notion of self, and somebody said, you're stupid, would I get angry? <laughs> Probably not. In fact, if I were actually operating from that place of no self, I would have compassion for this person who feels inclined to throw insults at people. It's no skin off my back. I'm not worried about this insult, but I'm a little worried about you. <laughs> I'm a little worried about your lack of compassion. Is there anything we can do about that? Do you need anything? And now notice all of a sudden I'm concerned about their well-being because anybody that's going around hurling insults at somebody, it's a desperate cry for attention and help. <laughs> so we should probably just give them kindness and compassion. That would probably be the way. Ah, but that leads me to the next aspect of Kashanti. What we want to notice is, what happens when I am attached to that sense of self? And that person makes some sounds towards me, and I interpret those sounds as words with meaning that pertain to me. And let's say I'm, again, let's say I'm clinging to that sense of self, and I get angry. And I say, no, you're stupid. And now it's a big anger fest, right? So it's now we're, we're going to get into a fight, a verbal fight. It might even get physical. Notice how it escalates. Notice how when one of us is Kashanti, it neutralizes the situation. And that makes it better for me and for you. Whereas when I respond with anger, it makes it bad for me. It makes it bad for my stomach, makes it bad for my clenching chest. It makes it bad for my heart that is now racing. And it makes it bad for you. So Kashanti is the win-win. Kashanti is a good way to go. In that sense, it's an insight, frankly. It's a realization, a Buddhist insight about, oh, Kashanti's the way. And I would want to go even deeper now into this idea of a patient tolerance in that sense. What you can, and by the way, I want to make this also really clear. For I said a, I said a few minutes ago, or however long ago, that for me. Buddhism is synonymous with Kashanti. Like it's a religion of peacefulness. It's a religion of like cultivating that peacefulness. Meditation is key to developing that, of course. But 
what I kind of want to get to is it's sort of about that, yes, meditation is important, but Kashanti is a practice that is done with the other. It's, you know, Kashanti all by oneself is basically meditation. <laughs> like if you're just by yourself being peaceful, that that's basically meditation. But Kashanti is this practice of engaging with others and that's happening all the time. And so what I mean is, is that for me personally, a big practice is about being very aware of when I am getting triggered, when I am getting angry. And I don't want anybody, I don't want anybody to think that I think this is easy. It's for me difficult to maintain that peaceful composure. I feel myself getting worked up. I feel myself, you know, and I'm sure you do too, but it's the feeling of oh, so many feelings when you really get into it. But it's like what I'm thinking about, by the way, I'm thinking about a, an argument and not an argument. I'm thinking about an argument that's about, you know, like, you know, there's a lot of arguments going on these days, always going on, but there's a lot of arguments going on these days, these kind of political arguments about, you know, whatever, take your pick, right? Take your pick, honestly. But the idea is being in those conversations can be difficult, can be tricky. And I recognize, I know, I experience the wanting to be heard, wanting one's opinions to matter, the idea of sort of a bunch of this stuff. And I spend a lot of my Kashanti time, like when I'm practicing this patience, I ask myself, what is really the value of saying what I'm about to say? What, am I, what do I really actually hope to accomplish by saying this? And is this going to antagonize the situation and be met with more argumentation? Because if it is, it's probably not worth saying. And so, but I recognize, and this is where I want, you know, again, I'm trying to be really honest about my own practice. I recognize the uncontrollableness of this, like that I'm sitting there going, don't say it, don't say it. Nobody cares. Nobody cares, but I still want to be heard. I still want to say something. So it's just a tricky practice, but I just sort of, for me, what's so lovely about it as a practice is there's plenty of opportunity all the time, everywhere to practice this. And as I was saying earlier about a, a violent state of mind and that you can cultivate that, you can cultivate argumentation. You can cultivate anger, of course, you can cultivate all of that stuff and you can get really good at being angry. All the more reason to cultivate Kashanti, to practice it, to actually practice it because it then becomes more no normal in the sense of more your default mode. Whereas normally the default mode is one of reactionariness, argumentation, and, you know, and basically uh, how, matching decibel levels, right? You get loud, I'm going to get loud. You get louder, I'm going to get loud, you know, because it's all about wanting to be heard. And I would then ask you again to analyze that desire of, I want to be heard. And then ask yourself, would the, would the world fall apart if I wasn't heard? Would, would this, if I don't say this thing, is, is the world going to fall apart? Because it feels that way sometimes, of course. Like when we want to say that thing, it's like, I can't. I can't allow this person to keep thinking what they're thinking. I have to tell them. 
what I've realized is that people are going to go on thinking what they think, regardless of whether I say the thing or not. And so again, it's about, do I want to just perpetuate an argument or do I want to skillfully find a way of de-escalating this argument and bring it, bringing it to a peaceful resolution without anybody knowing that's what happened? That's my MO. That's what I'm always sort of trying to do. Trying is the key word in that way. <laughs> that's a really good point, Maria. Maria says she realized that the louder she gets, the less others could hear her. It's true. Very true. Um, a few more things about, oh yeah, please, Noe. I... Oh. We go. Yes. Okay. Oh, thank you. I have come to the realization too that how much my this the realization of this biology has to do with this uh, this suffering. Mm. <laughs> it's just you know over you know sixty nine years of like, and the realization of like, yes. So it's just that you know there is this you know what's going on what's going on what's going on and the idea is like oh what. Well, I haven't had a bowel movement yet, so don't talk to me. <laughs> and that has helped me a lot. Less, less as a spiritual thing, but more as a just a biological thing. Am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I lonely? Am I tired? You know, that whole stuff. And and I think this is also before the Buddha, with the Buddha and past the Buddha. <laughs> Be here. Thank you. Thanks, Noe. Yeah, and on on that note of Noe's comment, the you know I also often mention uh, in in a lot of my Dharma talks one of the one great example is the idea. It's really related to what Noe said, but it's when we get hangry. So we get hung. We're hungry, but there's a way in which we don't recognize that that's what's going on and so we get irritable and then maybe angry this is common and indeed this is about what noe was talking about we have a biology a biological system here that the mind is in relationship with and this is the really tricky part about the dharma about buddhism it's about how one aspect of our mind the conditioned aspect of the mind the kind of lesser aspects of the mind are conditioned biological reactions but here's the thing about the dharma here's the thing about the teachings let's take being hangry as an example if you forget to eat and you are mindless meaning you forgot to eat and then you find yourself getting snippy or angry at somebody, right? And let's say that you are just letting the anger out. And then let's say, I don't know, I'm just going to make up a make up a scenario as I usually do. But let's say 10 minutes later, you were like, oh, you know, I haven't eaten today. Oh, and you realize. Oh, like, I, oh, my stomach's empty. And you're like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get angry. I was hungry, right? Totally understandable scenario, right? Well, during those 10 minutes, when you were not cognizant of the fact that you were angry because you were hungry, but you were, let's just say again, for the sake of this scenario, Let's say you thought it was your partner, your, your friend or your partner who was making you angry. And so you were angry at them. And then 10 minutes later, you realize, oh, no, I'm hungry. I, oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't angry at you. My point again is that during that 10 minutes, utterly ignorant, classic avidya, <laughs> confusion, ignorance. But the point is, is that that mind 
that was getting angry at their friend and saying, this is all your fault, that mind was conditioned by the stomach. And that mind was sort of uh, uncontrollably angry due to the biological situation going on and was not reflective about that. There's another state of mind that is that realizes I'm hungry. If I don't eat soon, I will start to get angry. I will not be angry, but it'll start to happen. And what I mean is there's an aspect of the mind that is not conditioned by this body, that can stand, out, uh, I don't want to say above it, I don't want to say outside of it, because this is not in any way ecstatic, but it is a way of the mind operating in an aware way versus the ignorant way where I was blaming my friend and not what was really the problem. So I wanted to like point out that subtle distinction between one state of mind that's utterly ignorant and another state of mind that knows what's going on. So, all right, couple more things about Kashanti. So this whole time, and I, yeah, I want to say this because I want to share this with everybody. So this whole time we've been talking about, well, actually, let me, I'll see if I get back to that one, but let me, this one's more important. So, so there's a word, there's a term in Buddhism. Actually, there's two words. They're related. One word, it's both are Sanskrit terms. One is akshobhya, and the other is achala. Akshobhya is actually the name of a Buddha, but it's also the name of a quality of a bodhisattva. And akshobhya means imperturbable. Uh, in, in modern English, with a twist, I would say untriggerable. Nothing triggers you. No triggers. Im impervious. In imperturbable. Achala, achala means immovable, like a mountain. And both of those, imperturbable and immovable, they have the same connotation. And what it is, is it's exactly that. It's imperturbable, immovable emotionality, I want to say. And it's not that you're not emotional. What it is, is that external words, external whatevers are not what dictate what's going on. And what I'm getting, what I want to get around to, or like the reason why I wanted to make sure to talk about this idea of being immovable or imperturbable is that I really kind of would like you to think about what it would feel like, what it would be like to be imperturbable to insults, injury, all of that. And now, contrast that state of being imperturbable and impervious. Contrast that with a state of mind in which some sounds, you're stupid. All just from a couple of sounds. And what I want you to notice or think about in that scenario where somebody, if somebody insults you and you get angry and you get upset, I want you to notice how out of control that is. That you're just, you're just letting the world push you around like a plastic bag in the wind. And if the world says, uh, get angry at me right now, you're stupid. Oh, you, oh I'll show you anger. No self-control <laughs> versus a state in which people could hurl 
hundred abusive terms like the Brahmin did to the Buddha. And imagine that you actually are not only imperturbable to insults, but imagine that you actually have compassion for the person who's throwing insults at you. Because you're not getting angry, because your mind is cleared out of all of that. What I want you to notice, again, in what I just said, is notice how being triggered and being angry, it's difficult to be compassionate in such a state of mind. So I, again, I just want to point out that the relationship between those two, that if we allow ourselves to be kind of perturbed and getting angry at somebody, then we are kind of cutting ourselves off from the possibility of having compassion for that person. And I know the mentality that says that person doesn't deserve my compassion. And that mentality should you, we should really examine that mentality because it's quite the opposite actually, in terms of actually then that person is the most in need of your compassion the one that you think doesn't deserve it in that sense. It's a tricky part about compassion in that way. Okay, so I hope everybody is fired up to become imperturbable and immovable. Again, it comes from practice and cultivation. It's not by way of magic. It is going to be just from cultivating such a state until you become imperturbable in that way. Speaking of which, let me return to the sutra in case I uh, forget. So I want to remind you then that, so the Buddha is getting hurled at all these insults by the Brahmin. And all the gods and those sentient beings that were inclined to kill they saw that the Tathagata could put up with this bitter abuse without saying anything in retort. And all the gods saw that the Tathagata felt just as he had before he was reviled. That's immovable. That's imperturbable. He, just the same as before the insults happened in that way. With a mind full of equanimity, beneficence, and kushanti, patience. And thereupon, 4,000 people generated bodhicitta. All this was perceived by the Tathagata. Furthermore, when the Brahmin, uh, keen mind, when the Brahmin had reviled the Buddha with 500 kinds of abusive words and found that the world honored one remained equanimous, the Brahmin's mind became filled with faith and respect. The Brahmin took refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha and planted the good root of liberation. And this was all the upaya of the Buddha. So that kind of last part, it's another amazing thing about Kishanti. Leading by example. And it's this idea that if you can demonstrate if you can keep your act together and demonstrate this kashanti, there's a way in which if anybody else were to see you being so immovable, they would be greatly inspired by you, not by the person who's being abusive and being angry. They would be impressed by you in that way. And it could even so happen that the abuser is impressed by you in that sense. Noam, you have a question or idea? Yeah, I was just noticing in that in that you're reading it again that the Buddha didn't 
their their their, their I don't remember the exact word something about their feelings didn't change mm -hmm. how they felt didn't change and I just wanted to I think that sometimes so we we can interpret Kashanti or you know uh, yeah Kashanti uh, compassionate response to things as being like oh I'm upset by that but I'm not going to act on it I'm not going to you know hmm. say things to you or yell or or express my anger but that's not what's going on here the, the Buddha wasn't angry it's not like the buddha was angry but didn't act on it so just kind of noticing that and thinking about that's just like a subtle but important point we're not trying to cultivate a uh i mean we do we do want to be not i think there's like a i think that it's like a gradual thing like first you cultivate non-reactivity and then over time you cultivate the non not having that even emotional reaction to it. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Noam. I, you, you're reminding me of something very important that I want to say about this. So, and this is something that I want to say that's very important to me because I know the way that a lot of this could possibly come across. So I really want to make it clear that I am not suggesting or promoting, and I do not think Buddhism suggests or promotes the suppression of feelings. If you're angry, then you're angry. And that is what it is. Like that's, that's what that is. So I do not think that any good form of Buddhism represses emotions like that. And I think many of you know that in that way. So it's why I actually teach the way I do, which is I teach sort of from the position of wisdom. And in, in I never want anybody to suppress their sense of self. I want everybody to actually awaken to this understanding and teaching of no self and really understand it and you know fully get it in that way. Because I actually think the other way where you're like, well, I'll just suppress what I want then that's dangerous. That's like utterly unhelpful. Like it's not useful to do that. So, but it is useful to think about these ideas and notice them. And it's why I mentioned in, in, in relationship to, uh, or in response to Renata's question about is all anger based on self? I feel like the way I answered that was let's explore. Let's look into that. Let's see if we can trade, you know? And so again, my my suggestion is to analyze anger and see if you can trace where it's actually coming from. Because I know it's easy to blame the other. Trust me, I know that. Whereas introspection, contemplation, these are more difficult and they require that moment of pause versus just reacting many of us, myself included, are just in reaction mode and we cultivate the pause, right? There's a, there's a really great expression in the yoga world. Think before you think. Great expression. It's this idea of like really being mindful in that way. And so again, my suggestions tonight have been about looking, examining, contemplating, but not suppressing. No, not repressing. No, no, no. In that way. So thanks, Noam. And by the way, on the, on the note, while I'm doing a little, uh, the, uh, like a little cleanup here at the end regarding these ideas so that nothing gets misconstrued, I also want to avoid any feelings of what what somebody might call um like well that that sounds like just being a doormat or this idea of just allowing you know just to be walked over or something like that and i'm certainly obviously not condoning that but i would in the same breath that as i was saying before about contemplation 
I would really encourage everyone to sort of examine, like, I guess it's sort of about when it comes to this idea of, of quote, being a doormat and just like somebody walking all over you, I would really kind of encourage you to think about the, the sort of, well, what I've been saying tonight about anger and the way in which anger blocks the possibility of compassion in that way. And it, and it would be, it's really, in my opinion, it's really righteous to be compassionate towards like the enemy in that way, because it's easy to be compassionate and kind towards your friends and loved ones. It's a real practice to cultivate compassion for the enemy or those who you don't like in that way. So what I want to kind of point at is this feeling of like, well, why do they get to just say whatever they want? And I have to be quiet. Well, you don't have to be quiet. That's what we're saying. It's maybe in your best interest to not add fuel to the fire of an argument. But I want you to notice that the mentality that says, they, you mean they just get to yell and I don't? You mean they just get to walk all over me? Notice the kind of clinging to a sense of self there and this feeling of like, oh, they get to do that, but I don't, da, 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 da. But notice how that's not going to lead to compassion for that person either. So again, I'm not saying, I don't want to say anything definitive or categorical in that way. I just want to kind of point out where we could examine notions of self, attachment to self, attachment to possessions, attachment and clinging in general in that way, and sort of noticing it in our own self, noticing it in others, and practicing kashanti. Ah, excellent, Maria, yeah. And no comparison for yourself in that case either. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Maria. Then Jenny. Oh, we're coming, Maria. Sorry, that was supposed to say, and no compassion for yourself. No oh, right. oh, excellent, 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 yes. In that case, either. Compassion towards self is just as important as compassion towards other. Absolutely. Yeah, Jenny. <clears throat> I have recently been experiencing a lot of craziness at work. And I'm finding that it's not a doormat situation at all. It's more of a superpower. Like if I could just sit with it, let the anger come and go, whatever happens, circumstantial, everybody's freaking out. Just allow that space. Then I could, I, I have like crazy amounts of compassion for all sides. So it's like there is no doormat. It is only a superpower. So that's it. Excellent. It's, yeah. When I was talking about being imperturbable and immovable, I should have said that is basically like being a, a superpower to, to actually be able to stay calm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Jenny. I may not initially be staying calm, but I stay quiet. Me too. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. You know, the shit happens, mm -hmm. going to come and go. And then what? Yeah. So it's definitely like, it's not like I'm not human and not just going like, fuck you, motherfucker. I just keep it to myself. Mm hmm which is a huge advancement in my, in my being. Excellent. And I mean, according to the, the path, according to the Dharma, the idea is, is that, and now you're in a position for the anger that is arising, that you're not speaking. Now you're in a position for that anger to start subsiding. Mm -hmm. And that eventually you actually won't even get angry and it will not be from repression. It will be from wisdom and cultivation. Excellent. Yeah, Noe. Okay. 
<laughs> um, yes. Fred reminded me of this one is be grateful for those who have been sent to teach you patience. And and that wisdom of patience. And 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 what I'm finding in my in my in my sitting uh is is that you know we the whole idea of of, of merit that we give it away. And that's when I've learned to give it away. Oh that, oh that, oh okay. I give merit to that person because it's a superpower. <laughs> so just be grateful to those who have been sent to teach me patience. Thank you. Nice. Yeah, and that's that's sort of a, a, a line a line out of uh, the Malakirti is basically that idea that a lot of times these people who are challenging us, they're secretly bodhisattvas who have come to help us practice patience. And I sometimes go into a lot of those situations like that, really thinking like, all right, this is this is like a great teacher, <laughs> like even though they're, you know, being angry or whatever at me, that it's a great teacher in that way. So actually, it reminds me, there's a, a great uh, quote from Confucius, very similar quote that says that it's kind of it's about how you can learn something from everybody. And the quote from Confucius is that you make the wise person your teacher, and the fool your lesson. <laughs> How not to be, in other words. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's going to conclude this, unless there's any last comments, questions, or ideas. Cool, I felt like that was a great talk about Kashanti. Yeah, Noe. Uh, Renata had a, a thing in the in the chat about uh, oh, yeah. uh, living living alone. Oh, okay. Let me go back and see. Ah, so okay, yeah. So Renata Renata's question is about how sometimes you know living alone, she notices that there's anger, but there's nobody else there. So so there's no kind of arise with no relation to self or a person to blame. And at that, on that note, Renata, I, I, I totally hear you. And, you know, I would suggest another source, uh, another source of anger, frustration, bitterness, all of those things is not getting what one wants. And there is a way in which the self lurks underneath that, but it's sort of about, in terms of Buddhism, we talk about me and mine. So the, the self complex, like the idea of a self includes both the idea of me, but right along with that is mine. And so a lot of times anger or frustration can come from like not getting what one wants, not being in a sort of position one wants to be in life, not having the amount of money one wants, not wanting having the job one wants, like all types of ways. And I hear you, Renata, that doesn't have to do with anything else and doesn't necessarily have to do with the self, but it may have to do with a kind of clingingness and wantingness. So again, all the more re uh, reason to examine anger. Don't fuel it. Don't suppress it but examine it. So, all right. Thanks Renata for that. Thanks everybody.